the handout we had for a progressive dinner this afternoon, I can't help but see right there in big maroon letters at the top of the page, September 11, which, I mean, we all know what that means. And how could have we known at that moment, though, the changes that would come in our country and our world later? How could we know? I mean, I, I understand now what my dad meant when I was little, and he would talk about, he remembered Pearl Harbor and how life changed. Before Pearl Harbor and after Pearl Harbor, the world was different. America was different. Before September 11th and after September 11th, how could we know at that moment that that would cause us to become involved in the longest war in the history of our country? We've had troops in Afghanistan for almost 15 years, three times longer than World War II, more than three times longer, longer than any other war. How could we know at that moment? We have these moments in time. Historians like to call them watershed moments. You know, a watershed is you have the, a high point, and the water on this side flows to that river, and the water on this side flows to that river. And how could we know that at that watershed moment, how different things would be? We have them throughout history. And, and, but it's not just the moment. It's what happens after the moment that causes the long-term changes. It's our reaction to that moment, and then the things that happen. And the church had one of those moments in the year 313. In the year 313, Constantine, the Roman emperor, issued something called the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan said that the Roman government now will not persecute Christians anymore. The Roman government likes Christians. It didn't make Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire, but it said, we are now favorably disposed towards Christians. A lot of historians and church people look at this as a great moment for the church, forgetting one really important thing. The reason Constantine issued the Edict of Milan was not for the church's benefit. It was for his benefit. He wanted all those Christians to support him, and he wanted a way to have some control of them. Because the persecutions weren't working. The persecutions just gave them less and less control over the Christians. By legitimizing Christianity, he, did, he made all those Christians who had been excluded from the political circles before, all of a sudden now they're in the political circle and they support him because he's the one that said, we're not going to pers persecute you anymore. He did it to the benefit of the Roman Empire and in particular to his own benefit as the emperor. And so what happened then is after that moment, which one day churches were being persecuted, the next day they're being protected. That's a watershed moment. And what happened is then, because the government was protecting the churches, the church and church leadership became closer and closer with the government of the Roman Empire. Till finally, in the year 380, after, after Constantine, Constantine is dead, there's another emperor in place. They issued the Edict of Thessalonica in 380 AD, which says now Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. But not just any Christianity. The Christianity the Roman Emperor said. So if you were a Christian different than the way the Roman Emperor was a Christian, you were an outlaw. So before the Edict of Thessalonica was issued, every congregation was local and independent. Every congregation had the right to do their worship service the way they see fit. Every local congregation had the way to be organized the way they saw fit. Every local congregation had the right to call and ordain their own pastors. Every congregation had the right to reach out to the community the way they saw fit. After the Edict of Thessalonica was issued, all those are gone. And now churches had to be structured the way the Roman government said they had to be structured. Churches had to only have pastors the Roman government had approved. Churches 
had to do everything exactly and believe everything exactly the way the Roman government said they had to do it. The church became a branch of the Roman government, which then that became the history in Europe, where in many countries to this day in Europe, pastors' salaries are paid by the government. I don't know if it's still this way in Germany, but I know it was when I went through seminary in the 90s. If you lived in Germany, when you did your taxes, there was a box on your tax form where you wanted, what church you wanted to support. So if you were Lutheran, you checked the box, Lutheran. And your offering you paid through your taxes went to the Lutheran church. If you were Reformed, you checked the Reform box. And your taxes, you, your offering you paid through your taxes went to the Reformed church. If you were Catholic, you checked Catholic. And that money went to the Catholic church. Well, how many of you grew up not Lutheran, Reformed, or Catholic? Let's see a show of hands. Yeah. What do you do? Well, there's a fourth box you check. It says, I'm an atheist. I don't want to give any money to a church. Because the churches were part of the government. Now, thankfully, a lot of European countries are getting away from that. And the churches are becoming independent again. But that's what happened at the Edict of Thessalonica. The church became a branch of the government, and you had to do it exactly the way the government said you had to do it. Some of you are in business. What happens if you do business the way the government says you shouldn't be doing business? Yeah, you're not in business. I mean, they make your life miserable. Same with the churches. You had to do it exactly the way they said, or you were in big trouble. So what happened then is the ownership of the church transferred from the people to a distant, faraway bureaucracy. And that distant, faraway bureaucracy did everything. They trained your pastors. They told you how to hold services. They told you when to hold services. They told you which days were special and which days were not. Everything. Well, multiply that. See, I, I talk about you had these watershed moments, but it, what happens afterwards is what really shapes us. So figure that's in... 380, over a thousand year period, think of over a thousand year period, where the people sitting in the pews of the church have nothing to say about what happens in the church. I mean, you start thinking, you can see where this is going. And they would have all stopped going except for one thing. The government said, now, since the church is part of the government, we control who gets to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. Because we are the church now. So if you don't want to go to hell, you better come to church. And you better do things exactly the way we tell you to do them. So the people know nothing over this time period. They're not, they don't read the gospel. They don't even have access to the gospel because now this bureaucracy holds it and keeps it away from them. And they fill in the gaps the way we fill in the gaps with our imagination. If we don't know, we just fill in the gaps with, with what we think. And so the people started filling in all the gaps of what they didn't know because they weren't allowed to read the gospel with superstition. This, this is why we, if we read about in the Middle Ages, everybody's scared of their own shadow. It's because all they know is superstition. Because the church won't tell them anything except you have to come to church or you're going to hell. And, and this goes on. And finally... After about a thousand years of this, people start saying, I, I don't think this is right. There were enough people who, who got trained in, as, as monks or priests who could read and then read the gospel and said, what I'm reading here doesn't fit with what I'm being told. And they started standing up and saying things. Well, the, the bureaucracy that the church had become had two ways to deal with these people. Either one, they were absorbed into the bureaucracy and, and became part of the problem, or they were dealt with very harshly. One of them was a guy named John Huss, lived a generation or so before Luther, and he stood up and said, this isn't right. And so the authorities in Rome said, hey, why don't you come to Rome and talk about it? 
Well, he went to Rome and they killed him. The difference when Luther stood up and said, this isn't right, was the political powers in northern Germany protected him. For most of his life, he was under a death sentence. And the governments of northern Germany, the places where he lived, gave him sanctuary. That's why he was able to continue doing what he did. And so, um, Luther says, this isn't right. Enough other people had said it. And now political powers are supporting him in saying, yes, this isn't right. And they had, let's be honest, the political leaders in Germany had political reasons for backing Luther. They, they might have agreed with what he said, but let's not be all rosy-eyed about this. They did it, they're politicians. They did it for political reasons. God used that, though, for the benefit of all. And Luther, about 15 years or so after this all gets going, 1517, Halloween, 1517, he puts the 95 Thesis up on a door at church in Wittenberg. These are 95 things we really need to talk about, to which the church didn't want to talk about, at least the people in power didn't want to talk about. About 15 years later, maybe a little less, maybe 10 years later, Luther went on a tour of these churches in Germany that had broken with the authority of Rome. And what he found was a train wreck. Because the people who led those churches, they had been priests one day, and because their ruler, their prince, said, no, we're not Catholic anymore, we're Lutheran now, they're a Lutheran pastor the next day. Well, they had no training. They didn't know. <clears throat> they didn't know anymore from one day to the next. So Luther goes around and he sees a church still filled with superstition and decides we got to do something about this. So he wrote a handbook for, for pastors to train the people in their churches, the large catechism, which to this day most Lutheran pastors probably have a copy in their office and have read. And then he wrote the small catechism. And in the small catechism, it says, in the plain form in which the head of the family shall teach them to his household. And we see there's the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, Communion, the Apostles' Creed, Baptism, examples of daily prayer. It says that heading over each of these sections. There's one more section about confession and forgiveness that this does not have this heading because that is more for the people to understand what's going on in church when they confess their sins and the announcement of forgiveness is given. But in each of these areas, it says, these are things that the parent is supposed to teach to their children in their home. No sooner had Luther written this than, you know, they could publish any, there's no copyrights back then. Anybody can publish anything. So as Luther writes this, other people get a hold of it, they start publishing it, they remove the heading. Because for a thousand, for 1,200 years, it's been the government has said, we're going to teach you what you need to know here. They took the church out of the homes, they took the church out of the community and put it into a bureaucracy. And that's what Luther was trying to undo, was get the church out of a bureaucracy and get it back into the community back into the home, into the families. And no sooner does he do that than other people take the wheels off the bus. Barely gets out of the station. And we have struggled with this as Christians, not just Lutherans, but all Christians have struggled with this now for 500 years as Jesus never intended the church to be a bureaucracy. He intended the church to be the gathering of his people. We're going to jump ahead. One, we have one more historical situation here. We we'll jump ahead to the Industrial Revolution. Million, 1800s, millions of people moved from the countryside and small towns into cities, these new cities, expansively growing cities. I recently heard uh, that in Detroit, they would... They, they had so many people moving to Detroit to work that, that they rented out housing not by the month or the week or even the day, but by the half day. So if you worked at a factory during the daytime shift, 
Someone else rented your apartment during that time and would sleep and eat and everything there. And then when you got off work, they'd leave the apartment, they'd go to work, and then you got the apartment for the night. Because they didn't have enough housing. Because so many people were moving into the cities to work that, that, that they just did not have an infrastructure to deal with it. All these people, they were working, they were moving to the cities for the wages. They did not realize how much it would cost. Because if, if housing is that short that they got to rent it out by the 12-hour span, you know what they're going to charge. They're going to charge every last penny they can. And you're going to pay it because it's either that or you sleep in the park where someone will probably rob you at night or during the day when you're sleeping, whatever shift you're working. And so all these people are moving into the city and they find it's very expensive to live in the city. Families move into the cities. They found the dad working in the factory can't make enough to support them because it's expensive to live and it's dangerous. Some of these factories, I've read, that people would line up outside the factory <clears throat> They'd line, there'd be a line outside the factory during the work time, during the day, waiting for someone inside to get hurt or killed so the next worker could go in and, and take their place. And, and they also found that they needed more workers. So they started hiring kids. And these kids living in these cities would work from 8 in the morning to 6 at night, 6 days a week. Now, if you're working from 8 in the morning to 6 at night, 6 hours a week, at back-breaking physical labor, there's something really important for children that they are not going to have time for. Not going to go to school. So the churches, who, who by this time in the 1800s, churches are saying, literacy is a good thing. Reading the Bible is a good thing. They're watching all these kids in these cities grow up illiterate, knowing they're destined for a life of poverty and they will never read the scriptures from themselves. So the churches take it upon themselves and something happens called the Sunday school movement. They say, we're going to do school on Sundays and we're going to teach them reading and writing and arithmetic. And our main textbook is going to be the Bible. And all these kids then are going to grow up learning how to read and write because we as a country cannot afford to have an entire generation grow up illiterate. It was a smashing success. Tens of thousands of kids flooded the churches. The parents loved it because it kept the kids off the streets, which were basically lawless. The churches loved it because, hey, we always love it when lots of people come to church who don't normally come to church. Probably the only people who didn't like it were the kids because they got one day off a week and what do they have to do during that day? They have to go to school. They don't get to relax on their one day they get off. Also, the government looked at this or enough people started putting pressure on the government about child labor laws and they actually passed some very good child labor laws, only to see Woodrow Wilson veto them when he was president. And he had reasons that when I read them now, I can't even fathom the public buying them at that time. So they, they started taking it piecemeal and they said, okay, in the most dangerous factories, we've got to get kids out of there. We've got to get kids out of the textile mills where they're getting their arms chopped off by these giant weaving machines. We got to get the kids out of, out of these heavy duty industrial factories. And they started going one at a time until finally they got, it really wasn't even until the 30s that the full scope of child labor laws passed. Now the church was faced with a different dilemma because now the kids aren't allowed to work these jobs all the time. And they built a whole bunch of schools, so they have schools to go to. And the church is like, hey, we got a good thing going. We have all these kids coming to church. We don't want to lose this. And so they changed gears. They switched gears away from teaching reading, writing, arithmetic with the Bible as their textbook to let's, okay, let's focus on the Bible now. Let's teach them the Bible stories. Let's teach them the, these Christian values and how to live them. And that was the birth of the modern Sunday school. 
It's a relatively, actually, it's a relatively recent invention the church has. That was a watershed moment. Oh, these are, these are watershed moments. But we had one unintended consequence that nobody in these early days of the Sunday school movement ever imagined would happen. And that as we ended up, happens all over the country. Car pulls up to the church Sunday morning. Some kids get out. The car drives away. An hour later, car pulls up to the church. Some kids run out and get in the car. The car drives away. That is never what the the founders and pioneers of, of the Sunday School movement envisioned. They envisioned being partners with the parents, not being surrogate parents in the education of their children. And this is, this is one of the reasons, when Luther wrote that small catechism for parents, Luther's reasoning was, okay, parents are responsible for feeding their children. Parents are responsible for clothing their children. Parents are responsible for raising their children up to become productive adults. And part of that responsibility parents have is teaching the faith and the values of Christianity. And it was never the intention of Sunday school to circumvent that. But over time, over about four or five generations, that's, that's become a real danger and a real problem. Anybody, some of you are educators I know, and anybody who's an educator will tell you, we can't educate properly without the cooperation of the parents. This is, a, this is an endeavor that, between the parents and the teachers to teach the children. And I've gotten more than an earful from teachers I know who have parents who seem to be fighting them on the education of their kids. And, and the, the thing with the church, the goal of the church is not to sort of circumvent the parents. That was never the intention. Or to take the responsibility away from the parents. The goal was always to partner with the parents in teaching the kids and passing on the faith. We're going to have some pretty big changes coming here in October, going to our Wednesday night education times, our Wednesday night services. The whole goal is to create an atmosphere within our congregation in which those of us who are adults are trained and equipped to pass the faith on to the next generation. That as a community, as a community, we are, we are not only excited about teaching the kids, that we are equipped. So when on the first and third Wednesdays, when it's the adult night, and, I, and the council gave me very strict instructions, this is not parents' night, this is for all adults. The goal is we learn a topic, we'll take, say, say the, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. And the parents, the adults, will have a class learning about that. And then the next Wednesday, myself and some of those people who were at that class will teach the same thing to the kids. And so we will want, we'll be equipping a generation to pass the faith on to the next generation. But in the process, we'll also be deepening our bonds together between generations. This church is in a really unique position that, that almost by accident, we really are an intergenerational church. A lot of churches put a lot of effort into being intergenerational and just can't quite get it off the ground. We are fortunate in that we don't have this segmented church like so many have. And this is, this is going to build on that and reinforce that, that the, that the adults and the kids and all the different age kids spending time together, the kids will see the adults learning about something, and then the kids will interact with the parents and learning it themselves. I, I really think whether this format we end up with, this, this format, this is really kind of a trial. It's a test for till, till the end of the year. What we end up with might look completely different. But what we have to do 
is we have to say as a church that, that it is our responsibility as a community of faith to pass the faith on to the next generation. As a, as a group, all those who are adults here, I say as adults, we have a vested interest in passing the faith on to the next generation. Problem is, the church never equipped us to do that in the past. That's, that's really what we're trying to get at here, is, is equipping a generation to pass the faith on to the next generation and have that generation grow up knowing how to do that themselves. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you this day when the date 9-11 reminds us of a terrible tragedy. Of some people doing some terrible things. We pray, Lord, you will use us in the opposite way. Use us to go into the community, to go into our homes, to go into our places of work, to go into our schools and live as your people. To bring the love of Jesus Christ, to bring the glory of God, and to bring the humility of Christ on the cross so that we can impact this town for your sake, so we can pass this faith on from generation to generation as it was handed down to us. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.